Hello, everyone. Everyone. Hello. Hi. Okay. So, welcome, everybody, uh, to this event that we're putting together at the Defense Energy Club, um, together with uh, SIA, the Science, Technology, International First Program at Georgetown, and then with our Center for International Studies, a little bit to try and understand what happens at COP26, right? I think a lot of us have been trying to follow the news and um, the initiatives, the agreements that have happened in Glasgow for the past two weeks, and we've seen certainly a lot of interesting stuff. So we've seen, right, um, this good, like a rise of bilateral agreements in climate, for example, on methane, and station. We've seen new commitments and updated commitments by certain countries, um, Nigeria, India, that according to the IEA, if met, which is, I think a big deal, but if met, you know, put us, on a on a on a path to stay or a closer path to stay below 1.5. We've seen um, important agreements on transparency and carbon markets and uh, Glasgow climate plan, right? That is hopefully gonna allow countries to enhance and update our ambition by next year. Um, but all of this is happening, right? And sometimes for myself, and I'm sure that for other is it's, it's difficult to. Uh, follow up to understand what's going on, you know, to see what happens at COP, to understand why that matters, um, to see where we're going next, and maybe where we're where, where we are failing, right? So these kind of questions are the things that we're going to try and um, answer here today. Um, we have a fantastic group of panelists, I would say. Um, so we have Mercedes Sofia, um, the head of the Global Vision Innovation Section at the EU delegation to the US, Marco Margheri, um, head of US relations at DNI. Uh, Joanna Luis, um, Bastia uh, Director, and Professor Georgetown, um, uh, Forest Service Officer at the US Department, and we have Claire Hill, just, in time. Time. <laughs> just in time, exactly, uh, the Director of the Washington DC Office. Um, so maybe, I mean, maybe I'll just start with you, Claire. <laughs> uh, that's good. Um, you know, I, mean, one, yeah, um, I think I would want to start, you know, with a short question. Um, so we'll give you all like one minute, a few few sentences only on what is the thing that surprised you at COP and what is the thing that disappointed you? Just a few sentences so we have, you know, uh, stage. Do you want to stick with the mask on or? Um, what are the rules again? Yeah, I think if you're not actively drinking or eating the thing with mask on, but if, with speakers, maybe the same. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll try yeah, to see yeah, yeah. you can drink while speaking. Yeah. Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's not actually. alcoholic though, but no. <laughs> so hello everybody, I'm Claire Healy. Sorry to be a bit late. Um, okay, so um, I feel like this week we have been, it's been like the battle of the narratives <laughs> about the COP, right? It was a frenetic two years trying to prepare for the COP frenetic two weeks once people were at the COP and now it's like how we how we tell the story of the COP and why that's important is because um, I think how people feel about it and the legitimacy and its credibility I think it does drive a lot of um, uh, drive or not progress right because it is their momentum right but when people say was it success was it a failure I mean it's we don't look at it like that, right? It, there are signs of progress, and there are lots of proof points that we can point to, and like that was a surprise. Like, um, I mean, it's bizarre. Like the language on coal, again, we can argue whether it's coal phased down or phased out, but and it's a bit bizarre. It's taken us thirty years to get that word in, but we've got the word in, right? And when China and India tried to get the word out everybody else sort of stood firm and it could have all collapsed and unraveled at that point, right? Which it wouldn't have been a surprise, but it remained in, right? So um, there was that, I mean, loss and damage, that wasn't actually a really surprise because we've been saying that for a long time um, to developed countries. And again, you have to look at these as a package, right? You can't just do what you want on one side of the ledger and just stay firm on the other. These things are negotiated as a package. It's all agreed or none of it's agreed. So we've been saying for a while, loss and damage, it's not going to go away as an issue. It's just going to get louder. And um, it did, right? And so again, you know, we've got uh, dialogues. Again, as some people say, it's very disappointing, more dialogue. But at the same time, we've got, you know, US, Europe and others on record. I mean, Dr. Kerry giving personal assurances that, okay, we're going to go away and actually think about this concretely. Um, so I think that is, again, a surprise, a pleasant, not a surprise, it's something to work with, sign of progress. 
I mean, the finance is always comes down to the money, right? And again, the sums being thrown around, it's very confusing. A hundred billion wasn't, you know, that was a promise made, not delivered. 80 billion with some extra pledges, maybe it's maybe it's delivered 2022, 2023, right? But then there is numbers being thrown around like 130 trillion, like the Glasgow, uh, what's it called, GFANS, Finance Net Zero Alliance, I can't remember all these acronyms, 130 trillion, I mean, and that actually landed a bit like a lead balloon, I think, because the number was so huge, it didn't, you know, people were very skeptical, right? And everything in between, right? 8.5 billion for the South Africa deal. So a lot of money, um, but clearly that is something now we've got to figure out um, how we work differently to mobilize that money, right? You know, US, Europe, others mobilized 12 trillion to prop up and you know stabilize our economies post-COVID. So the money can come from somewhere. And now we've really got to think creatively. And there are signs, there are shoots of progress, you know, there are processes alive, not just find the money, uh, but then move the money to where it needs to go to help other countries with their energy transitions, right? So to answer your question, um, we don't say success or failure, signs of progress. You can add it all up, you know, not just what was in the, the, the rule book that was negotiated. Again, some, some things are real teeth around transparency and the carbon markets, none of those were given. Every, all of that's hard for five years in some cases. And that gives it some teeth. Um, you know, the NDCs, many countries did step up with ambitious NDCs, some countries didn't. And all the plurilateral agreements, initiatives that were announced, methane, forest, cars. But you add all that up, right? And you know, people have quantified all of that. And it gets us, I think, to a fifth. You know, we were trying to like hard emissions by 2030 on route to you know net zero by 2050. I mean, these are all long-term goals to keep stabilize the temperature, right? You can say 1.5 or two. You add all that up, and you know, if you put the positive spin on it, it made, you know, we were at 2.7, we were at 2.4. If you add all of that up, IEA said you could get to 1.8 degree uh, a temperature increase if everything was. Or another way of looking at it is that in 2030, that takes like a, a further like fifth of the emissions out of the picture. So all of that was still, so about 80% more to go in terms of emission cuts by 2030. So it, like it's never enough, right? So, and you know, when we're talking about all of this, it is never enough. It's never, ever going to be enough, right? So it is this paradox, it's both. Right? And so we've got to live with the both, it's not one or the other. Can't spin it, oh, it was a success, it was a failure. There's lots of progress, we're going to take it, we work hard for it, inside and outside, and we're going to thank it. Perhaps take a little bit of a rest and then come back, and we've got to fight for it all over again. And it's clear what those you know, priorities are for next year, which obviously we can talk more about. But um, yeah, it's, it's both, right? So signs of progress, uh, but signs of despair too. Thank you. And also, uh, yeah, Joanna, what did you think? You know, um, surprised you positively disappointed you the companies, I would say. Well, I think the, I mean, so I, I follow particularly sort of issues related to China and the, the US China relationship. And so obviously the, the joint declaration was a nice surprise. Um, and I think something that did catch many by surprise. This was for those who don't know, you know, during the sort of last 48 hours of the COP. Um, during press conferences, sort of back to back, the the head of the Chinese delegation, Minister Xie, and and, and um, Special Envoy John Kerry, did these press announcements where they announced this new joint declaration on on climate change, really focused particularly on action in the 2020s. So, you know, I think this was it was you know it was obviously a strategic time. It's sort of in these last final hours of the COP when you know negotiations are starting to. Um, get really difficult and you know it really I think injected a bit of energy and momentum you know obviously what China and the US do is important to everyone else so you know really sending the signal uh, to the you know industrialized and um, developing countries and you know I think in particular there's you know there are things in this agreement that um, were missing from other parts of the, the conversation and so I think it's really important in that way you know I think um, for example, you know, China had just submitted its uh, revised NDC right before the COP started, and there was sort of not a lot new in there in terms of what China had already announced. They had already previewed the targets, and, and you know, I think that disappointed some who thought China might kind of come with a last minute 
surprise that would, you know, reinvigorate some of the other developing countries to do the same. Um, but then, you know, you see things in this joint announcement, um, like a, you know, real focus on increasing action in the 2020s, which, you know, if you look at the analysis behind what China's targets are, and where they need to get to, to get to carbon neutrality, and then how that flushes with a 1.5 degree global goal. I mean, China as the largest emitter, you know, what they do is just important to the world's ability to meet these global goals. Um, you know, more has to be done and it has to be done before 2030, right? And so given that China's not gonna go back and revise its 14 five-year plan, this puts down a placeholder to say, you know, we are actually gonna look at enhanced mitigation this, this decade, um, which is I think, you know, what they really need to be doing. And then that's obviously positive for the broader process. Um, you know, there are other things in the, um, you know, the announcement we can talk about, you know, if you want to get into it, like, you know, meth like, so to work on methane, non, non CO2 gases is also something that there hasn't been a lot of focus on, but again, it's really important when you start to think about carbon neutrality. Um, so I think that is significant. Um, and then, you know, as, as Claire mentioned on coal, I mean, this is another area where China had not put, you know, language specifically on phasing down coal, you know, in an agreement like this, it's not in the NDC explicitly, although of course it is what is required um, to meet, you know, to meet uh, carbon neutrality goals. So, and then I think, you know, if you look at the language in there, you then look at the final Glasgow pact and, and you see a lot of parallels, right? So if you hadn't, you know, and I'm, you know, <laughs> going to give some credit, right, to the U.S. and I'm sure the EU and others that, you know, if that language, and, and we saw this actually, I should say, in the lead up to the Paris Agreement, where there were U.S.-China deals where language was very carefully finessed. I'm going to credit actually Susan Yaz, the, the lawyer at state, who I'm sure had a hand in this. Um, and that language make, made it into the Paris Agreement as sort of a compromise between developed and developing countries, because if the US and China can reach that compromise, right, there's these broader repercussions. So you actually saw that play out, I think, in Glasgow. And that's how, even if you're not happy, you know, perfectly happy with the wording in the final agreement, it, the, the word is in there. And, and I think it's much more significant than not having any mention of, of coal and fossil fuel phase down. So, um, you know, I, I'll stop there, but I, I think, you know, that was a just sort of an interesting angle, you know, that sort of to the broader process at the COP, it allowed for uh, progress on transparency and, and other issues, which we may talk about, um, because that, you know, China has played such an important role in that as well, which is sort of core to the, the whole framework and understanding progress on mitigation. Yeah, I think we can get in depth into all of yeah. these issues uh, after. So if you can, you know, be a bit short and yeah. kind of, you know, your disappointment and your, your surprise type of things. Sure, yes. uh, thanks very much. Um, I, I think that was already a, a, a great <laughs> summary from, from Claire, um, Professor Lewis. And, uh, you know, I certainly agree there's currently a battle of narratives <laughs> going on. and. Um, the, the US China announcement was one of the biggest surprises from our side as, as well. I mean, one, one thing I'll, I'll say um, generally is that a lot of the parameters are already set going into COP. Most countries have made commitments already, and if they, they haven't yet, they'll probably do it at the, the World Leaders Summit, as we saw with India in the first few days, where they had a new um, net, net zero target, for instance. Um, but what I thought was uh, surprising and, um, you know, Positive in a way is we really didn't know what the outcome would be from the, the Paris rule book, but the things were going to come together in a massive way. So to have uh, the carbon markets, transparency, um, as well as a common time frame, which is um, how often countries submit their, their NDCs uh, to all come together, that was um, very positive to see. Um, I, I think what was also really notable about this COP is, is kind of what we're seeing in terms of the shift to implement the implementation side and the partnership side. The focus used to be just on negotiations, but now it's really uh, the non-negotiation piece, which is enormous. Like every country has a big pavilion. <laughs> every country is announcing 10 initiatives on a daily basis almost. Um, but we've seen some things kind of take off from that point in a way we haven't before the, the level of commitments and financing going into these things. Um, some of the, the initiatives were already mentioned, like the, the um, Ukraine pledge, um, just really uh, kind of um, shows that the COP has been shifting in this uh, over time. Uh, but maybe I'll just pause there in the interest of time. Yeah. Yeah. Marco, what about you? Um, your perspective on this? Well, I can 
uh, I can easily build on whatever yeah, has been already said. Uh, and thank you for, for having me here. Um, let me put three baskets on the table. What was deemed as necessary before and did not happen. Let's start from the past testers. Uh, the first aspect is the magnitude of commitments that was considered by the global movement the satisfactory call. But we knew it was not going to be the satisfactory piece. And ultimately, Glasgow was a, a reality check. And the reason it was a reality check, I think, was also linked to the second thing that I personally believe is essential and did not happen, that did not, did not yet happen, that is bridging global climate action with global development action in a thorough sense. Uh, he, the African Union will be calling uh, a summit to discuss the outcomes of COP26. I would not expect their review of COP26 as being satisfactory in bridging the need for sustainability in their pattern with the possibility of having baseload power, of using their gas resources as a way to as a way to carve out those coal investments that were luckily uh, phased out and not down uh, already in this declaration. So this first block, I think, falls into a great picture of reality check, uh, that this COP was a, a strong moment of, and that was ultimately needed. There were things that were less deemed than necessary, but which instead happened. And let me add one country to the world uh, global picture that uh, analysts have, have drawn. Saudi. Uh, it may or may not be a welcome, a set of welcome positions, but the producers are now fully on board and around the table of global climate policy. This is a major achievement, even if the level of the toolbox that we, have, we are sharing with them is not yet to that level. A few days ago, there was an, a, a very interesting seminar uh, at, can I name other universities in this? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking on national oil companies and ESG, a nondescript university in the Northeast of this country. Uh, and actually the sense of commitment that national oil companies need to have to step up is in fact emphasized by the participation of their own governments in, the, in this kind of policy. We will know more about their emissions. We will know more about their environmental, social, and, and, and governance risk. And this is, I think, uh, a very important factor for them. And let me close with a third basket, which is very relevant in the perspective of investors. Uh, as, as they said, we are moving from discussing the framework into discussing the toolkit. And the fact that there was an, uh, an agreement on Article 6, albeit preliminary, it reminded me, Mercedes, of our first renewable directive in the European Union, where cross-border renewable uh, volumes should be pre-authorized and very carefully monitored. It will happen. Look at where we are now in the EU regulation on, on renewable trade. Uh, I think Article 6 was, uh, we, we, we met when Franz Timmermans was in town. Article 6 was completely out of the picture of the negotiation uh, items that were achievable, and we had uh, second item, the participation of finance. Third item, uh, the methane, the methane plan. It's not all encompassing. It's not fitting in the actual governance structure, but that's the logic of the Paris Agreement of the NDC. Let, let's have flexibility in what countries can bring to the table, provided there is bona fide in bringing the maximum possible effort and provided there is a cross-checking amongst countries as to whether this level is indeed the maximum possible or not. So ultimately, I think, uh, and, and I'll stop here, and sorry for having been wrong, but ultimately, COP will demonstrate uh, something we've been discussing in other panels uh, of the Georgetown Energy Club, that when you have international multilateral for cooperation, the same fact that you have an agenda that forces you to meet has a value. Uh, we've been speaking this, about this in the US Energy Council in other contexts. I, I think COP well demonstrated that. The fact that COP existed triggered a community of, of, of climate policy proponents that have 
did, that have devised some solutions and some uh, and some degree of progress. I think that's very relevant because I've been hearing, you know, people you know, questioning what, what the value of ops are sometimes, right? And certainly the value of people is compared with some that especially um, where there is any deal on um, your surprise and disappointment from the user perspective. So a lot has been said already. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to summarize, but I think I agree with those who said that the, the Paris Blue Book uh, was far from uh, the done deal before the top. Actually, there were a lot of, I think, efforts in the narrative to lower the expectations that we were going to get anywhere on that. And, and we saw how things ended in, in Madrid uh, last uh, few years ago, etc. So, so I think that, that's a big success and it's, it's part of, of cooperation among countries that will be uh, very fruitful and, and will help everybody also come to the table um, in the future. So I think that's, uh, and it was a very technical negotiation, very difficult to follow and it's really for experts, so it's very, very important. We could be dismissed because it's an expert uh, thing. Um, I think the other thing that I, I really like and appreciate is that, as I said before, that the top part, um, you know, is then with a lot of different things that happen in the negotiation room and, and around you. And there's always been this structure, as Claire uh, described very well, uh, of the inner thing and, and everything that goes around it. But this one club I found has found a way to bring everything in. And if you look at the red side of the COP, actually, you have some of those deals, the Global Medicine Pledge, the South Africa deal, they're in, on the official website and they're actually, they actually contribute to the um, to the different um, ways in which we are going to be able to, to lower emissions. So I think that, that's important as well. In terms of disappointment, of course, I think we're all disappointed that we couldn't get farther, we couldn't get to where we wanted to be in terms of ambition to keep, I mean, we are all saying that 1.5 you know, keeps within reach, and I think that's true. Um, but as uh, Timmermans has said, you know, it does not stop here, it's just, it's just a start. And, um, and I, I love this. Um, Metaphor of I think Claire who said is the the train of ambition that mm -hmm. leads now and, and I love it because I, I come from a family that has been working in the railways for generations, <laughs> um, but also because that is very true. It's just, you know the the, the the train leaves the station now and this is now what we need to work and and I think it's really good also that the the final declaration also includes those milestones and also includes that acceleration of how we're going to get there in the next few years to the ministerial meeting um, every year, which I think will be also important. So that's still talking about making sure that we have those milestones and we can uh, get prepared uh, in advance of that. And then if I just can say another thing, is I think the European Union played uh, a particularly useful role because we came to the table with our homework done and, uh, and with everything in place, our kind of law, all of the uh, commitments and, and a specific plan on how we're going to implement them. And, and we haven't stopped there, and I will get into detail about that because yesterday we had an additional um, legislative proposal and strategy that was published that was super interesting. And certainly, credibility helps the organizing in this kind of negotiation. But I think this was very helpful. I think now we have kind of like a list of surprises and disappointments, you know, going from all capital markets, transparency. So we can now kind of break them down and go in depth into each and, and one of this, uh, try and understand uh, what they mean. So I think, um, Claire, uh, I'll start maybe with you. I think D3G, for everybody that doesn't know, has been reporting about COP and has an excellent study that I would recommend that you read on on coal and climate finance, particularly. That's something that you typically look in depth. That are, that are very linked, right? So um, I would say in these particular two issues, um, can you like, give a brief overview of why they're key? Why are they key for climate action? Where are we now? What did we achieve? Um, and what, what are you know surprises and disappointments in, in that in that sense, or challenges and opportunities in those two and those two aspects? And maybe we can you know expand a little bit on the South Africa case and the West region, how that can help us uh, move forward in that portfolio. Um, so can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Um, so just just on the uh, the, the COP, I think uh, uh, when you look at it, I think when you look at the sort of the direction of travel, I think uh, people feel good about it. The direction is pretty clear. I think ninety percent of the global economy now is covered by a net zero pledge, right? I mean, by twenty fifty, sixty, seventy, 
Um, but that direction of travel is pretty clear, which does change the dynamics and you know, the competitiveness issue, which, which comes to the fore when the calculus countries make what is in their national interest. Like ultimately, that's why they will do more or not. But so the direction of travel you can feel good about, but then you look at the pace, uh, that's good, right? And um, I have to say, the train of ambition, I think, is the Minister of Tuvalu that said that in the closing ceremony. I thought it was a good metaphor. Um, I can't take credit for it. Okay, on coal, right? So um, one of the, um, you know, the key objectives that the UK presidency set for this COP was the COP that, on the one hand, you say the COP that killed coal or consigned coal to history, right? And um, there was a massive push on that you know, from the last couple of years, including the Secretary General of the UN, I mean, really going out on a limb, just saying, um, and then the uh, EPG was part of like with the uh, UK and Canadian government, they created this housing plus coal alliance. And it's an example of how these, you create these diplomatic platforms, right? Um, and they, you know, they don't just happen out of thin air, literally it's like, you know, it was out of a meeting and there was one female minister with another female minister, I have to say, came together. This is why we had to look at Trump, and they're like, what can we do? And they were like, why don't we create this platform? And you know, what, you know, all of a sudden what is impossible and people say will never happen, can't, never, won't. You just put it out there and it just gives the impression, hold on, it gets a bit crazy first of all, it's a bit unconventional. And then it moves into the mainstream. The more countries that join, the more cities that join or provinces or businesses, then it moves into the mainstream and it gets that momentum and then others join, right? So this was all part of the push towards Glasgow, right? These things are done in a very much context. And a lot of work going on like through the diplomatic machines of multiple governments, right? Europe, all the member states, you know, you have to coordinate all of that in the capitals, right? Of the countries that either have coal pipelines, that, you know, that they have plants under operation. A lot of analysis, literally you can count. We know, I've got colleagues that have a database. How many coal plants are in operation? How many are in the pipeline? Permitted, built, right? It's all there, the data. Again, you have to collect that. And then you connect it with the people in the capitals and the banks. You know, it's a multi pronged strategy, right? You know, you're targeting the banks that are financing it, right? Um, so all that's been going on, like to get to this moment where you try and get all the parties to say, okay, we're not going to do coal. And I said, we're talking about the COP out of Glasgow, right, as the platform of global cooperation on this global action problem. But there are other there are other processes which focus a lot on, like the G, which is G7 and the G20, which, you know, by bizarre twist of fate, UK and Italy also posted, and we think it's on the clock, right? And so post-COVID, again, the politics and the context and the space for like interventions change, right? So like you get the language in all of those processes, right? Really, and again, really hard for like G7, G20, you know, the top 20. And the big battles are what the words are. Not just the um, the signal, it says, but the financing. We'll stop financing coal. Right? So um, the UK, after Climate Plus Coal Alliance, they also set up this Energy Transition Council, which again had four prongs as a strategy, right? Um, one was... Um, so get the big three to stop financing coal, China, Japan, Korea, right? Um, get other countries and states to join the Paris Plus Coal Alliance just to add that momentum. And like you, you know, the US, the federal government wouldn't join, right? Never the previous administration, nor this one, but you can say more about that mm -hmm. for good reasons. And um, you get the citizen states, so that's PPCA. Third, the clean energy offer, which I'm coming to your uh, question and just want to give you some context. And fourth is coal decommissioning, right? Using public finance to decommission coal, right? So you get pillar one and two, right? And um, stopping the finance and the power and plus coal alliance. Again, those platforms share the technical know-how, right? If you fade out coal, how do you do it? What do you replace it with? How do you get renewables on the grid? How much do you penetrate? Like they're platforms of countries, no one knows how to do this, like fade out coal, go 100% clean or net zero. So the more platforms you can get with countries, you know, which are basically just people, like this is the foreign service group, right? You'll be in these uh, these positions or businesses where you actually sit and try and figure it out, right? So there's those platforms. 
But the clean energy offer, like you can't in capitals when you go in some of these emerging economies like Indonesia or India or Vietnam that are growing. And you just go, oh, you know, not for my daughter, sorry, would you stop burning coal? Or would you stop mining coal, please? And they're like, they don't want to hear it, right? Because they're like, hold on, like, for good reason, like, hold on, we want to grow our economy, provide comfort for our people. You did it for 150 years, sorry, talk to the hat, basically, right? And so you've got to change the, you know, dynamics around that. One is the net zero, the signal, the direction of travel. When you are building a modern economy, Right? You want to create jobs for your people, you want to get stability, you want to get investment. Look at this, look at the signals, look at the trends. You have to do it this way because it's this is what modern economy is going to look like. And number two, let us help you, right? Um, yeah, we did that, right? Don't please don't repeat our mistakes, right? That would be the definition of insanity. Learn from our mistakes, and we're happy to help you. We didn't know it's spewed up greenhouse gases, we do now. But let us help you figure it out. Here's and help means not just the technical help, but the finance help, right? A long way around to get to answer to your question, right? And we've been saying for ages, right? You can't go into these capitals, Europe, US, babies, yeah. Um, and just say, stop burning coal, please, right? You know, you've got to be like, no, here. And this is where political economy comes into it at the end of the day. It is politics, right? I, you know, and when you're in those capitals, you know, any it, it sort of went down to like a few million for some technical assistance. You know, help, let's help you do a study. Let's help you look at what, what you can do, right? Which is all very important. It's not going to change the politics in time. You know, given the pace we need to move at. We've been saying for ages, we need billions, right? You know, we need billions. You need to do a deal, right? What's it going to take South Africa okay, to, to commit? Like your utility is in debt under water, you're getting rolling black out. This isn't working out very well for you as is. How can we transition? How can we help you transition, right? And so then you start negotiating, and this is where it's good, the US coming back, with Europe. We thought, again, we've been saying this for ages, and then just in the last few months, there was some urgency, and they went to Johannesburg. Obviously, in South Africa, the politics have to change. There's a lot of people there working to create it is possible, let's do it. This is a better future, blah, blah, blah. That came together. So basically, the deal was 8.5 billion, right? It was negotiated between the G4, as we call it, US, uh, UK, France, and Germany, I believe, yeah. and, and the SIFs, the Climate Investment Fund. And it had a big chunk, the big focus was around transition and just transition. How do you help those miners, right? Um, and plant operators transition. And the money, uh, this is the key thing, is like some of the public finance to get the renewable energy on stream in a lot of these economies, you need to get the coal offline, right? Because it just changes the economics and the renewable energy projects aren't always profitable. To use public money, to de uh, public finance is one to build stuff, right? To build infrastructure. To say, to make the case that we use public money to dismantle something, Again, a huge leap, right? And it's a massive amount of skepticism when you know national governments are like, hold on, we're taking that plant down. Why do we put our like you know sign with our flag on it, right? You know, mm -hmm. saying we did this. There's nothing there, right? So these are I mean, I'm being a bit facetious, but like this is what um this, these are all innovative steps, right? So we're hoping the South Africa be on and real money on the table uh will help change the politics, right? And again. But again, the, out of that, at least like COP, wouldn't, we didn't would have had a South Africa deal if we didn't have a COP. It forces action, the focus is mine. And, but then now we've got to make that happen, right? Like where is the money actually going to come from, right? 8.5 billion. And that's on the donor side, on the South African side, like is it actually going to make you go free and do it in a fair way and just match the COP? So we need that reporting mechanism, a colleague of mine is completely working on that with this government. Now we need to take that, do it again, again with India, again with Vietnam. I'll say one final thing on that. So one, where is the money going to come from? Like for real, like for real, right? And there are ways and we can find it and we can do it, if, you know, we'll sort of figure it out. And then how do you move that money to where it needs to go, right? And I was a bit disappointing, actually, I've not changed my answer to question one, right? My <laughs> biggest disappointment, I have to say, was, um, when you had like President Biden, von der Leyen, uh, President uh, von der Leyen, and um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson doing their press conference around that 
are there new initiatives to sort of do infrastructure investment in other countries, right? You'd think this was a good thing. So we've been saying we need this for a long, long, long time, you know, build that better world, clean green initiative and global gateway. And we've got that in the G7 in June and we did it all. We thought this would be a great platform. I see the need that we can do it. It's just a shame, in my view, we have three different initiatives, right? Um, and so again, now this is the work before us where we sort of figure out how it's all going to fit together, you know, coordinate that. Where's the money going to come from? And that means Europe, US have to work as shareholders of the MDBs, the banks, etc. Come up with some creative means to connect the flows of fiber, right? So that's all the work before us to make the South Africa deal real. Do others, and again, the time you know clock is ticking, right? So we've got a lot of work to do to, to make that real. But that's why you say call, you know, you connect all these bits together and coordinate it all. I think you raised very important point, right? On South Africa being able to be, you know, a roadmap for other countries and the infrastructure deals that we've seen being presented, being important elements of a clean transition to net zero. But the question is, you know, where does the money come from? And that is pertains to you said, you know, the EU and the US are okay. able um, to our EU and US speakers or government representatives here to ask some of these questions. Um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Mercedes. Um, and we've all seen, right, you know, EU being a leader at home with the 55 package and, and other initiatives. And I'd like to ask, you know, when the EU goes into the table, how do you convince people to scale up ambition? And what role does kind of time play in that? Or, you know, the biggest country or kind of finance? And second, a bit, you know, what are the EU sponsored initiatives that you're most proud of um, and that you cannot elaborate and go in depth with them? And where did you see that, you know, EU interest didn't, didn't really materialize? And why do you think that happened? Thank you. So, um, well, some of it has already been addressed by Kevin because of the, uh, the uh, South Africa and that transition deal is also partly negotiated by the EU. So, um, I'll, I'll leave that that. I think that the, the um, the EU and the US working together at the top really made a difference, and it's great to have you know, the US back at the table. Um, and and of course, the EU is still a big leader, so we should be also you know, doing our homework because there's a lot to be done in the EU as well to lower our, our own emissions. But I think we are we come with that credibility of having already done the work to, to make sure that we lower those emissions. Um, and I think that um, there's, there's a great uh, cooperation between. Uh, Especially Will Terry and uh, Executive Vice President Zimmerman, they've met many times ahead of the COP, during the COP, and they, they also meet at crucial times before they meet others to make sure that you know, we're not divided on the narrative, we're not divided on, on, the, on what we're offering, and, and that has you know, led to a number of things, um, and also the work of the team as well. On, on the global method spectrum, it's the very first time I see instruction sent uh, all the delegations of the European Union uh, around the world. Saying we're going to be with the US, so when you approach your counterparts in the country, please go with the US ambassador. So doing this together, I think, makes, makes a difference, of course, and, um, and that has led to a number of different success experiences. So, one that has been mentioned before that I want to give a little bit more detail on is the global method pledge. And, and this has been, again, uh, as uh, Professor Lewis has uh, signaled, is, is this COP that has paid attention to so many issues beyond pure CO2 um, uh, mitigation. So um, methane, as we said, is a very potent uh, polluter. Um, it's also low hanging fruit because we have the technology to limit uh, emissions of methane. Methane emissions come from um, energy, from waste, and from agricultural cattle. So we need to, uh, we know how, how to do it, and we have the means. And um, what we need is transparency to, to do it. So the, the pledge is um, uh, those countries that have signed in, which I think we're at the 103 at the COP and all of the join, um, have committed to lower their emissions collectively by 30% by 2030 uh, compared to 2020. So it's quite a, <laughs> a small um, time frame, unlike other, you know, other measurements that we have for CO2 to do it. And um, I think the, the, what's really good about it is, well, there's some finance attached to it as well. And but also, I think it's crucial, there's a transparency mechanism that has already been devised. So um, before the COP, the EU, um, the UN um, program, put money into creating an international method of territory. 
and we want uh, the US and Spanish Radio Observatory to be very happy about. We want others, including companies, to join the observatory and start contributing data so that we can create that transparency to see whether people uh, in different countries and different companies are actually realizing their commitments. Um, and we can measure um, in 10 years whether we have actually reached that 30%, probably more reductions than 30%, certainly that 30%. So I think it is a great um, yeah, perhaps model also for other things that need to be done. Um, you know, you need the, the commitment, you need enough um, countries behind it, you need the finance, and you need the mechanism as well. And um, I would agree, and this is one of the ways some of how this call has moved into implementation of this report. And then one that hasn't been mentioned yet is the EU Catalyst Partnership, which is also in a way a partnership with the US, but with another part of the US, uh, with the uh, part of the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So this is about developing the um, technologies that we need to make the, the transition happen. So things like green hydrogen, um, storage, we know that one of the big issues with uh, renewable energy, and Mark will be able to explain this much better than me, is that we don't yet have means to storage um, a renewable energy so when the sun is not uh, on and there's no wind like happened this summer um, in the EU. Um, you cannot store, except if you then produce hydrogen to fix that as a storage, um, a renewable energy for one. So this is one of the areas where we need to invest. And these uh, early investments are very expensive. So the idea is to some um, foundation money there and some public money. And the idea is that every Euro or, or dollar of public money will produce a threefold investment from the private uh, And uh, so I think those uh, that's the technology side that also needs to be um, brought to the table. But I think it's also um, as I was saying before, the, the, um, the South Africa partnership is, is a great example of cooperation. Is a great example in terms of the um, because it, it also involves a lot of consultation of South African uh, stakeholders that happened beforehand. So, from the point of view of labor, of reassuring the uh, people working in these industries that this is going to work for them, that it, it can do the transition in a way that is actually going to improve the future of their families and their children, um, is, is also very, very positive. So, I think it's the law that needs to be uh, looked into so that we. Um, we develop others, as Claire has said. Um, so I think you know a, a lot of these initiatives that the EU is pushing forward, you know, tie very well with the US in terms of the cooperation. So let's let's hear the words again um, right now. And I want to ask you two things that we haven't really touched upon um, so far. The first one would be a little bit on you know the long strategy, the long term strategy that the US has. Um, elaborate on that and a little bit on you know when the U.S. goes in front of countries and tries to talk for other countries to scale up their ambition. Um, what challenges do you find with your strategy? Is it you know ambitious enough? Um, will we see um, more ambition in, in, in that strategy, particularly the term? And second, um, um, a thing that is quite technical that I know that uh, you negotiated personally at COP26, which is you know, the transparency and rule book mechanisms. So um, if you can expand on, you know, we now have a complete rule book. Uh, what does this really mean? What did we agree on? Um, and, and why is this why is this important? And if you think that, you know, having these will allow us to drive a condition. Sure, both uh, great questions. Um, so maybe just to start on the US long-term strategy was uh, announced in the first few days um, of the, the meeting. Um, it sets forth a number of potential technology pathways to, to net zero emissions by um, 2050. Um, the, the documents on, online, if you, if you look at it, you can see some interesting figures about how there's different um, emission reduction contributions from different sectors, um, switching to clean energy, uh, electrifying, uh, various uh, sectors as well as um, land use and that land sense um, and uh, across all emission sectors um, essentially. Um, a, a lot of that is grounded in um, near-term uh, emission reduction work um, set out through the, the NDC um, for 2030. There's a 52% reduction compared to 2005 levels. Um, in addition, we have a 2035 uh, clean power goal. Um, beyond that, the, the sort of 60 
kind of strategy or however long it is sets out you know various pathways to reaching that it's it's not prescriptive in that we're going to say we're going to be 100 percent renewable so we're going to completely go to nuclear or we're going to completely switch to a hydrogen economy so there's there's different pathways to, to reaching it and um you know there's going to be uh, advances, new technologies, as well as cost reductions and existing technologies that happen in the next decade. So it's you know a necessary function that there's some um, different um, pathways to reach in the, the mid-century goal. Um, so how we get there. Is very kind of clear plans that have been set out by the, the administration. Um, I guess in, in terms of um, ambition, I, you know, the Biden Harris administration is pretty much doing everything they can within the, the constraints of um, you know what is, is passed through Congress. It's just the, the way the, the U.S. government functions, um, and, and the special envoy Kerry likes to kind of point out that the U.S. is now only responsible for about thirteen percent of global emissions. So. We'll do what we can in the US, but we also need everyone else <laughs> to step up. So that's where that kind of ambition and, and diplomacy piece comes in. Um, and maybe to, to pick up on some of the comments about the, that um, kind of diplomacy work, we're, we're all working with these, these major uh, emitting countries, in particular the, the G20 members, who are going to be really responsible on the um, emission side to whether we keep 1.5 within reach. And that kind of diplomatic work uh, and political work goes on throughout the year. So, you know, just to add a, a few more examples with, with India and Indonesia, we've had um, you know, long running climate working groups and dialogues and, and a number of trips this year in coordination with, with other uh, donors and supporting groups. And, we may not be able to deliver on everything <laughs> this year, but the plan is we need to get movement this decade. Um, so you know, the, the COP, as, as other supports that, is only from the time um, we, we keep moving on, we keep going, the G20 is going to be released the next year. So let's see what happens. Um, let's see if, if there's kind of more positive outcomes along the lines of the interesting pilots we, we've seen. Um, maybe the, the just the, the last interesting piece on ambition as we kind of switch into this net zero framing. I think one of the things coming out of COP was the, the greater focus on hard to abate sectors. So there's a strong realization that beyond rapid deployment of renewables in this decade, we need to tackle industry, um, heavy transportation, shipping, and aviation. Um, yeah, uh, we need to. Um, Get to those those sectors which are hard to decarbonize, and and there's some interesting efforts coming out like the first movers coalition is creating market demand, um, managed to get commitments for green steel purchases by 2030 from a group of companies, which would not have done that without this initiative. So um, there's, there's it's interesting to see sort of new focus on 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 that area. Um, and then I guess switching gears to transparency, part of the, the Paris rule book. Um, I was part of the negotiation team for the US on, on that piece. Um, this basically concluded six years of, of in-depth uh, negotiations, starting with the Paris Agreement in 2015, which for the first time required common reporting and review rules for, for all countries, both developed and developing. Before that, under the, the convention, um, there were a very different set of rules for the so called Annex 1 developed countries and non Annex 1 developing countries, essentially requiring much less stringent compliance for developing countries. Um, Paris changed all that. Everyone has the same reporting requirements on greenhouse gas inventories as well as um, tracking the indices. Um, and providing information on support provided and mobilized, as well as uh, support needed and support received. Um, with the caveat that there are still uh, specific flexibilities for developing countries, the languages um, 
that needed in the light of their capacities. Um, so we've spent about six years kind of <laughs> going from the Article 13 language of Paris, um, which is you know, a couple of pages or less, to the document we had out of this meeting, which is maybe 50 or 60 pages long, that lays out in detail the tables for greenhouse gas inventory submissions, the tables for the, um, it's called the structured summary, which every country will input information on their NPCs into. And this was both technical and political. We really need the uh, transparency experts to go through the inventory tables to go into the sectoral background <laughs> tables on waste and agriculture and energy and, and kind of make sure everything is correct from a technical perspective. But then there's also these remaining political issues. There's back, there was backtracking on the Paris Agreement, whether we should still have broad flexibility so that developing countries don't have to submit these detailed tables beyond the sort of top line summary. Um, there are contentious issues around confidentiality of data, which we reported. Um, and those issues, uh, in fact, in Madrid a few years ago, led to uh, what we call Rule 16 in the process, where there was just no outcome. Um, countries couldn't really uh, try to block the final outcome. So we were like very much behind the ground this meeting. Um, but it came together, it was a very delicate balance. Um, all of those reporting requirements are, are in there. Um, so um, flexibility only um, applies to a very specific set of criteria, like for instance, um, uh, non CO2 gases or uh, time series of emissions, where there's very kind of specific rules around what developing countries don't have to, to provide. And that was in the balance to the last moment. But I think that the momentum of, of the meeting, the US China announcement, the goodwill coming out through. The, the closing plenary and the work of the UK presidency and, and the EU and others really helped kind of um, bring things together. So while there's things that no one was happy with, <laughs> it, they weren't unhappy enough to completely block consensus and outcome. So it was a kind of very interesting negotiation, negotiation outcome in, in that sense. Um, so maybe I'll stop there. Yeah, no, I think that's one of the surprises that we certainly should celebrate that people sometimes, you know, don't realize the importance that these mechanisms have and how long we've been trying to negotiate them. But you mentioned the importance of the US-China agreement in this context of the public general. So let me turn back to you, Donna. You mentioned uh, these a little bit at the beginning. Um, what's kind of, so you've been following this, you know, four years, uh, China-US climate, uh, Relations. So, what's kind of the significance of this uh, of, of this agreement? Um, did you see anything there that surprised you that you're particularly, you know, happy to see there? Um, and a little bit more on on China's participation. Um, where did you see that that uh, China was lacking any talks? You know, following which went in and both you know, stepping up and you see that that's going to change anytime soon because we know that you know countries are kind of being to enhance their ambition um, by an ex-cop, so did you see that coming? Sure, um, maybe I'll start just with the second piece first, I mean, because I, I think that um, in terms of China's role at COP, I mean, the, the headline going into COP was, of course, that President Xi wasn't attending, right? Um, you know, most leaders did attend, and so this was sort of cast in the media as China doesn't care about climate change, you know, because the president's not going to show up. But of course, you know, without the broader context, the president Xi has not left China since the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, so I don't think this is a slight to the cop specifically. He did, you know, um, deliver a recorded speech, you know, at the leader summit. Um, and of course, the, the delegation was there and, you know, full force led by the, the, the climate minister, the head of the delegation. So it's not that China wasn't there, right? But I, but I think it is sort of interesting um, to sort of see, you know, I always sort of see this dis discrepancy between the role China plays at the COP and then kind of what China's doing domestically at home on it, you know, because really, of course, China's climate position is very much informed by its own domestic energy challenges. Um, you know, most of China's emissions driven by coal use, um, most of China's energy use coming from heavy industry. Um, so I do think this focus on the hard to abate sectors, you know, this is really important, um, you know, where you have countries like China, that it is 
still very much about cement and steel and, and these you know very energy intensive industries um, that are driving a lot of what, what is happening there and then of course the full power fleet um, and so you know I think China was in a bit of a tricky place um, this year going into COP just you know politically but because of its technical challenges at home and, and you've heard in the media about how there's been blackouts and you know electricity shortages um, and that therefore you have local governments sort of ramping up coal production at this time that China is making these carbon neutrality commitments, which doesn't look good for them, right, also on the international stage. So I just think it's a balance, right? And so China's kind of going in where, you know, a few years ago, actually, in the lead up to Paris, China's coal consumption was going down um, for a variety of reasons. And then, you know, in 2014, actually started going up again um, quite rapidly. And, and during the pandemic, there was still very rapid economic growth and, and rapid energy use. So, you know, China has this 2030 pledge to peak emissions, um, which, you know, depending on when you've kind of looked at that pledge since they made it back in 2014 has looked either really easy to meet or really difficult to meet, sort of depending on the domestic context and and it's, it really has been rapidly changing whereas you know I think when the pledge was made I would have said this is pretty ambitious a few years later it started to look like they were going to easily peak many many years earlier now it's looking like we'll be lucky if they peak by 2030 you know so this is a constantly you know shifting um, situation and, and that of course you know so just for, to make the point that the, the domestic context very much sort of limits right what countries like China can do and of course this is not unique to China in any respects right all countries are sort of limited by their domestic political situation, which is in, in the climate negotiations informed by their energy structure or their emission structure, where, wherever it comes from. Um, and so just, you know, the on the US piece, I mean, I already spoke to it, so I won't say much more on, on the significance of the mm -hmm. declaration that was released. But I will just say, you know, I, I think it's, it's always interesting to look at how the bilateral, just as sort of interesting how the domestic affects the multilateral, how the bilateral affects the multilateral. And we've talked about all these different processes that are all ongoing in parallel. With the formal top itself. You can, you can give me another question. <laughs> uh, at the centralized European level, we have an emissions trading scheme, we have had a series of renewables directives, we have a, we had a number of ways in which we pushed supply to evolve. The United States has brought to the table, well, not really aligned with COP, but let's say will bring to the table in 2021. Let's see how, what happens in Congress between here and December. Trillions on changing supply. So we do have policies that allow us to evolve. And Article 6 is, for example, on, forests, on forestry and, and, and the value of carbon, allowing us to invest on being good guys and to invest based on existing demand to decarbonize our supply. That's far from enough. And that's far from enough because let me start from a figure. The, the World Bank tells us how many kilowatt hours per year families around the world consume. I may be wrong in the latest numbers, but take the order of money. In Chad, it's 80 kilowatt hours per year. In my home country, Italy, is 3,000 kilowatt hours per year. In Italy, everybody heats their homes with gas. So those 3,000 3, kilowatt hours per year are basically a bit of air conditioning and light. In France, where sort of 95% of households heat their households with electricity, this figure is 6,500. So twice as much as in Italy, understandably so, because power provides a bigger chunk of service. In this country, electricity only provides 40, 42% of household heating. So we should be somewhere slightly above Italy, slightly below France. We are at 13,000 kilowatt hour per year per family, produced with a power mix that is evolving in the right direction, but of course, demand is there to capture fossil fuel demand. So basically, what we are telling people in Tianjin, or even worse so, in Abidjan or in Lagos, is that we are asking them to curb their consumption because 
we cannot keep consensus and keep together with demand policy. Do we have any proposal for carbon pricing in the United States? Carbon pricing means creating those disincentives that shift demand from a carbonated, from, from a carbon intensive demand to a lower carbon. Do we have any proposal for carbon pricing in the United States? No. Not, not only we do not have it, but the entire political spectrum considers that unachievable. Do we have energy efficiency proposals in the Build Back Better and in the infrastructure package? Yes, a tiny bit. If you take the European Union energy efficiency legislation, you can, I think, you can, including that of member states, you can fill this room. If you take what's in there on energy efficiency, you see that it's entirely on utilities. There is nothing on the final consumers. And I think you wouldn't even fill one corner especially because we like data. But the, the message I want to share with you is that up until we do not enlarge the policy design to demand, businesses will do their role, will be at the center stage of the narrative because they are the guilty ones, but will not actually be able to shift investments because there will not be a different demand. Hydrogen is a fantastic example. Hydrogen is not a problem in terms of building supply. Hydrogen is a problem in terms of finding somebody that finds it economical and useful to use hydrogen as their molecule, as their vector of choice. So let me conclude going back to call on one of the fundamental questions that between the pre-COP that my country has hosted in Milan and COP emerged thanks to the youth movement. And I believe, well, first of all, I'm very proud, given the circumstances of what my country has done with the European Union and uh, with the United States. I think it was the G20 plus COP26 was a, a good exercise in, in, foreign, in foreign service terms. And a, a little word of praise for my colleagues in the, in, in the government and in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, a lot has been said at pre-COP on subsidies. Horrible things. I believe subsidies are a horrible things, are a horrible thing because they are exempt and misallocated. But when we go to Cairo next year, we should have the youth from Sweden and the youth from Cairo discussing on how they go to work. And the youth from Cairo goes to work with gasoline that needs to be subsidized or they take the street because they will not be able to reach the place where they get their pay from. A fantastic paramount example of an ill-designed policy was in France on desubsidizing fossil, uh, fossil fuel and ICE to subsidize electric vehicles. What happened in Paris, that policy made a lot of sense. I give away my old ICE and I take whatever electric and I'm incentivized. So I'm taking away something and I'm given something as an opportunity. If I live in the wonderful region of Perigord, where the average distance from a household to a pharmacy is beyond 15 miles, I do not have that solution. And when the government tells me that on top of the incentive for the electric vehicle to make them more interesting, they curb my speed limit. So I drive slower and I can extend the range of an electric vehicle, I become a gilet jaune. In France, of all places, where climate awareness is amongst the highest in Europe. So let's go back to, to your question. We need policy design that helps us doing our scope three objectives and that translates our scope three objectives into citizens and households and companies shifting their demand requests. Without that, it's not the companies shifting their supplies or moving from a, a fantastic example here, I'm sorry to quote other companies, uh, Shell under the pressure of investors has sold a refinery here 
so to limit the parameter of scope three. It is so to penalize. How many emissions have we cut with that sale? Well, Shell investors have reduced a bit the, the, the carbon tenure of their share. Not one CO2 emission has been cut from the US system. So we need to create a different model. And unfortunately for the political system, the hard truth is that either we deal with demand or there is no Paris Agreement. So with that note, um, that is quite powerful. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to open it up for questions. So if anyone has a question in the public or online, people hearing us, um, um, yeah. can ask, yes. well, to wanted to ask, could you introduce yourself? Oh yes, my name is Ann Broom. I wanted to ask you all, do you uh, have any thoughts about the carbon emissions uh, offset trading for, uh, the agreement parts of the agreement that came forth. I don't know if anyone else is okay. No I had just to say one thing. Uh, necessary, not sufficient. Necessary because you have a number of streams of investments. I'll give you an example in a second. That were hanging on this missing piece of policy not sufficient because this piece of policy is not yet complete in the sense it is not yet fully valuing the trading possibility. So the possibility of having cross-border investments that achieve maximum effectiveness at, with, the maximum, with the maximum efficiency. The example I wanted to give you is forestry investments. Forestry are the low hanging fruits of offsets. They are nature-based, they, they are there, there is a number of policies of positive spillovers, and they're typically in countries that benefit from foreign direct investment. Forestry investments were held up by a lack of clarity on how you calculate the value of that CO2 ton that you are reducing and how you can trade them on markets. So Article 6 was an essential tool to continue. Now, Article 6 gives governments, local governments, a great margin of maneuver to decide whether or not the trading will be open to which degree, in, in which ways. And I have to say that there is too little role for IFIs in, in, in the framework of Article 6, which are instead pretty much needed because those streams of investments really require concession of finance, especially on the side of governments. So I think it's a work in progress. The value extracted in Article 6 is not to its maximum, in my perspective, uh, but the fact that it's there is a major achievement. Thank you. Questions? Uh, my name is Katie Marissa. I'm actually a student at Johns Hopkins but I'm really interested in the topic. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What a bold orange. Orange. <laughs> in the audience then. Uh, so, my question. Was again uh, related mostly to climate finance over there. So, a few days ago in my climate change class, we're doing a climate simulation. And we use this model, CROs, that MIT has developed. And with the current pledges, if they are met by 2100, we get to 2.9 degrees Celsius, which is a problem. And even with China and India doing more, it comes down to other developing nations that are likely to see their emissions. Just ratchet up next century that are likely contributing to a lot. And they are the ones that are going to be needing the climate finance the most. And right now, with like I don't think we've talked a lot about the green uh green climate fund. How are the different uh size represents here going to be contributing to that much more meaningfully? Right now, like the EU uh, President Wang uh committed about five billion dollars. I can't remember the US commitments right now, but even those commitments fall much, much shorter than 100 billion centimeters, even that 100 billion is likely not going to be enough to meet the needs of these other developing countries. So what can realistically be done in order to avert those emissions from ever being emitted so that we could realistically target two degrees or lower? Thank 
the US puts into the green climate fund or the adaptation fund or the SIPs or the European Union, right? And um, but like and they need to put in more, right? And then the money they put in needs to work much harder. That's about capital adequacy rules. Again, an area where work is going on. There's a task force in the G20 looking at if the World Bank, for example, just lowered their risk ratio, it could unlock like 750 billion to 1.2. Yeah, anyway, um, but like, there's lots we could do to make the money go further. And there are small interventions governments could do, like just backing up some of the credit that countries take, right? Massive amount the IMF could do and is doing, right? You know, um, not just using their special drawing rights, you know, that have been issued post COVID, looking at new ways of how you use them and how rich countries can reallocate them to build resilience. But so there's a, there's a massive agenda going on, and in, also in terms of financial regulation, right? Another, I mean, you know, you look at the COP, right? And then you've got to look at um, all these commitments, and the European Union and the US have to be credited in looking at all the tools and needs at their disposal. Right, across the whole of government, right, including financial regulation. So you're talking about demand and supply, right? So you have the supply of capital, the supply, you know, the people that make the decisions where money is spent, right? Ultimately determine the rate of decarbonisation, right? Which where they put the money, where they're not, and how do they make those decisions based on the perception that they're going to get paid back, right? They're going to make money, um, and so again, that's all those sort of signals. So, so a lot of the supply of capital is saying we're going to be net zero, we're going to be you know, Paris aligned, we're going to use science-based targets to make our decisions. And a massive job to do to really hold them to account for that, right? You know, and that's now, that's not in a couple of decades, right? So there's that saying we're going to supply. But then those that sort of are just trying to keep quiet or hope it all goes away or just keep making money off this stuff. Then you have regulation and again this is an area where uh, pleasantly surprised again europe sort of out in front saying this is how we're gonna like classify this is our methodology for measuring what is paris aligned what economic activity is a paris aligned what are not some are obvious some are not right and and, uh, and but then also like china and others are like we can't have just many many different sort of methodologies and we were worried the US was going to come in and say, mm, we don't do taxonomics, we're going to do our own thing. And not just US, but all the different regulatory agencies, 12 of them make up the Financial Stability Oversight Council. We're all going to do our own thing. And again, this is where the Biden administration and into bilateral you know, cooperation and international pressure and pressure from the financial private sector help us like don't make it more confusing tell us what is what isn't right so the us and china again cooperated on this working group out of the g20 on sustainable finance and laying out a roadmap right so it's not just public finance although it's a massive role for that we need more of it in china. but how it really shifts private finance and fast right because if we stop building the stuff that's putting the you know, emissions up there we'll, again so i do think that we'll get to you know so it's what we look at right it's what we measure so you look at the green climate fund you're going to be very depressed <laughs> um because it's a small amount of money and people are fighting over it and the governance and you know we're never going to meet any 2030 zero targets right but open up the aperture and I will just say something because we haven't really talked about loss and damage, which I think is, again, you know, again, and I hate just using that term like loss and damage, right? We just roll, rolls off the tongue. I even shorten it in my notes, like L and D, right? When you actually stop and think what that means, right? This is for like whatever happens here on, like there's, you know, there are enough emissions out there. These are impacts are baked in, 
And this is again where the pot is a very different, and it might be a very precious space, but the pot is 197, right? And I think you could see that play out in Glasgow, which again changes the politics and the art of the possible. The minister from the prime minister from Barbados, the minister from Maldives, face to face with President Biden and Boris Johnson. There's nowhere for them to hide in this process. China, India, like you know, um, I mean, for me, the most poignant moment was at the end when the minister from Maldives said, I mean, this is like he said, what and you know, they all had to agree, they all had to decide whether to support the package or vote it down. And it could have all gone down the shoe at the last minute, right? And, and they all, you know, had to, they had to say that no, they knew that what's on the table was not good for them, right? as in the existence, right? Their home, their ancestry, that, you know, like, you can't even imagine. And I remember her saying, you know, what is balanced and pragmatic for you is too late for us, right? You know, so, um, uh, loss and damage again, but what was agreed, you know, talking, well, let's set up a new facility, like it's a knee jerk response, right? And the US and Europe are like, no. And again, that's why we have to think through um, what are we actually trying to do here? Because uh, this is the work we have to think about now, like what are the concrete proposals? It's not always the best thing just to set up a new fund, right? You know, the adaptation fund, the green climate fund. Like, I mean, again, I'm not saying it is or isn't, but I think we have to think through. We could set up a new fund or facility. And call it loss and damage, and countries could put some millions in it, like great. That's not actually going to deal with the problem of loss and damage, right? You know, so we have to think, we have to make the institutions we have, right? And how many gets directed through the system? We've got to rewire all of that so it's this way, not that way, right? Because that is the trillions. I mean, that is the global economy, what, 80 trillion? And I mean, that's all going to shift. So when you open up the aperture of it, there's a lot more happening and a lot faster, right? I mean, even two days ago, Basel, which is the committee uh, in Geneva, I love the committee, it's a city where lots of um, commissions sit and they internationalize, cooperate, what are the financial regulations, right? In the insurance sector, the pension sector, the banking sector. And they said like sooner than I think we ever saw or hope, we have to look at Basel rules to align with the Paris Agreement, right? And again, and this is why you get the US back in action and Europe. And that's why them cooperating with other venues and forums will really start to WTO, right? Start to see that out. You know, this is where we've got a hard wire into the global economy while we have President Biden in the White House, right? And I'll put that. There's one more. Um, I don't know if you want to add something. Very yeah. quickly, the, um, like, so I want to um, give a shout out to my colleague from the European Investment Bank. So that's the part of the EU uh, architecture that also came with the homework I done to, to, to cut the six and, and be uh, way beyond. Um, they are higher the line. They invest most of their money in the European Union, but also 25% growth. And they have been looking at the system um, and also hiring experts, which is not just not forming the band, but getting the people that can tell you with the green investment in quality investment and to also do what they have to do what they need for green uh, investment, which are more complicated than building the world or building the um structure uh, sometimes, although it's a little bit of that too. Um so you know other banks could help to usefully learn from that experience on how the bank has transformed itself to to grow to prices. So maybe last one uh big short yeah. Countries under the old system, 
as, as I mentioned before, there was this kind of qualification to Requirements, but they um, they agree to it, and a, a large part of that is, is support for capacity builders. In terms of factors, I say it, it's not uniform across the region. So to say that there are Groups that are sort of more supportive of, of strong transparency outcomes, and then others which have been um, kind of very reticent to get on board and, and have um, blocked progress uh, along the way. Um, but what we actually found in the, the outcome of, of this meeting is everyone came together and made concessions, and there were enough commitments to um, you know, support this capacity building process and understand that. The, the reporting to developing countries um, will, will take uh, time and it's not going to be perfect when the first new reports are due in a couple of years. Um, but, uh, you know, with every um, uh, successive report, we expect to see um, improvements. And it, it really kind of, along with the, the carbon market rules, it, it just binds together the Paris Agreement. So we have this, this template where countries Submit NDCs and mid-century strategies, they ratchet up their commitments every uh, ideally every five years, which we have a common time frame as well. And they report on what they, they're doing. And that's you know essentially um, what we have um, specific areas of compensation So it's it's very significant that we have that now and, and as we're just seeing the sort of work is now in a way outside of the Paris rule work space to like improve what countries put into that uh, framework in the subsequent years and, and how we can get to um, the uh, 1.5 or well below two degrees goal which is you know, core to the impact of the world Thank you. Thank you and thank you everybody for this fantastic conversation from this game. Um, I like to invite everyone to follow us at the Asset Energy Club and see how we organize these type of events throughout the year. So if you're interested in energy and climate, please feel free to uh, follow the Asset Energy Club and see us and we're going to be collaborating in the future. But, uh, and can I just say, yes, Dr. Lloyd will be teaching a class next semester on international energy governance. Uh, in the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, let's yeah, some promotion there, but hopefully this has set some light on what happened in Glasgow these past few weeks. So thank you everyone. Enjoy.